Hello and welcome to the interview on France 24. We are in Jerusalem today and my guest is Nikolai Mladinov. Hello and thank you very much for being here with us. You are the United Nations Special Coordinator for the Middle East peace process. But let's be honest, there hasn't been any peace process for years. It was already the case before you arrived in 2015 in Jerusalem. There are no negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians. So we are wondering, and I apologize for being so blunt, uh, but can you tell us what you are doing? I'll be the first one to admit that there is no peace process, because I see this every day um, when I work both with Israelis and Palestinians. Um, our tasks currently have focused on pretty much three areas. One is to prevent another war in Gaza, which has become a very big part of our work. Um, secondly, to keep um, uh, supporting the Palestinian uh, people. Um, in building up the institutions and preparing them for the future of statehood. And thirdly, to work with the international community to keep the um, consensus that has existed for such a long time, that the only reasonable way to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian um, conflict if, is if the two peoples separate peacefully um, and states of their own, the state of Israel and the state of Palestine, um, find the appropriate security and other arrangements that need to exist. Um, and that is the only way to, 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 to move forward. Because if we don't move forward in that direction, we have the reality of today, which is a reality of um, occupation, of perpetual conflict, of constant threats to the security of both Israelis and Palestinians, um, and generally a lack of hope. So you just mentioned we often see violence between Israel on one side, Hamas and Islamic Jihad in the Gaza Strip on the other. Uh, several hundreds rockets were fired uh, a few weeks ago, and you said in your last briefing to the UN Security Council that in Gaza the dangers are not over. You're talking about the risk, and I quote you, of another war that would be far worse than the terrible conflict of 2014. Do you think this new war could start soon? I think we are always not more than two to three days away from another war in Gaza. Um, and this is the situation with which we've lived in for the past year and a half to two years now. Um, the reasons for that are very complex. Um, I can summarize them in three groups. Um, the first uh, reason is the fact that the situation in Gaza over the last decade has deteriorated dramatically. People live in terrible conditions. Unemployment is skyrocketing. Um, a year and a half ago, uh, people lived with three hours of electricity per day. So there are very strong social tensions that exist in Gaza. Secondly, we have uh, the constant risk of escalation with the protests on the fence of Gaza between um, uh, the Israeli forces on one side and the protesters on the other side. The first day that the protests started in uh, March of last year, there were over 60 people killed in one day. This has added a lot to the tensions on the ground. Since then, we've seen um, kites, incendiary balloons, IEDs come across to, to Israel, sniper fire, etc., which has caused the communities on the Israeli side of the border to live in terrible tension and, and the fear of rocket attacks. And thirdly, is the risk of uh, the absence of a political reconciliation process between uh, Hamas in Gaza and Fatah uh, in Ramallah in the West Bank. Um, the lack of such reconciliation means that people don't see much prospect for any political resolution to their problems. So our task has been, over the last uh, year and a half to two years, to prevent another escalation, because I very much believe, very, very firmly, that if we see another war in Gaza, it is not just going to be more terrible for the people on the ground, but it is going to have regional complications um, that nobody in the Middle East can now afford to have. You've often condemned the, the excessive use of lethal force by Israel. You also called it a violation of international law, the settlements. Uh, other countries are doing it too. But nothing uh, is changing. The Israeli policy is not changing. Is there impunity for Israel? A French official told me recently, and I quote him, we are still apologizing for the Holocaust, for what happened during World War II. This is why we don't go further than than mere condemnation. Do you feel the same way? Look, our positions um, um, are based on international law and the assessments that we made as to the situation on the ground. When we see that force is being used um, unnecessarily, we call that out. 
when we see that uh, measures are being taken that are not in line with the commitments that Israel or any other party has in terms of international law, we call them out. We report to the Security Council regularly. I go to the Security Council once a month to uh, brief them on the situation on the ground. In fact, um, in December I have another briefing which will focus on settlement construction in the West Bank, on violence and on all of these um, developments that have taken uh, place over the last few months. Um, whether there is any action or not based on these reports is in the hands of the member states. Um, the member states are fully briefed both in the Security Council and in the wider international community um, as to what is happening on the ground. They understand the situation but if there are any actions that need to be taken, um, um, it is in their hands. But how do you explain that no action is ever taken? How do you explain that? I wouldn't say that there is no action ever, because I think um, on a number of occasions we've seen how Israel has changed some of its uh, behavior on the ground in order to uh, reduce tensions. Um, we have seen other cases in which this has not happened. For example, uh, settlement construction in the West Bank, which is against international law and is one of the most fundamental problems to, to uh, reviving the peace process or to the two-state solution, continues. Um, despite the resolutions that have been passed by the Security Council, despite uh, the resolutions that have been passed by the General Assembly. Back in 2016, um, the UN, together with the European Union and the United States and uh, Russia, uh, put together a report, the Quartet Report, which outlined the uh, uh, obstacles to reviving the peace process and what needs to be done by all sides, including the international community, the Israelis, the Palestinians and everyone. Unfortunately, uh, very few, if any, of the steps that were put forward in that report have been um, taken. Um, and I keep working with everyone and encouraging them to take these steps because I fear that if we continue down the path that we have today, it is not just going to be a permanent reality of occupation and suffering and anger, but this situation will melt down and it will create a bigger problem both for Israelis and for Palestinians. And that is what one area that we need to avoid most certainly. We'll talk about the Palestinian leadership right after that, but first a question about Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister. You meet him from time to time. Do you believe he's a reliable partner for peace or that, because of domestic policy reasons, he's in favour of the status quo? Look, I can say this both of the Israeli and of the Palestinian leadership. I don't think either side right now is in a position to um, negotiate a final status arrangement um, or um, a sustainable peace agreement between both sides. Uh, why do I believe that? Because I know that in Israel the public opinion has moved uh, unfortunately very much away from the premise of land for peace on which the Oslo process was built. And this is reflected in Israeli elections and the um, attitudes of people. If you look at the last rounds of elections, um, people uh, did not even focus on the issue of uh, uh, the Palestinians. They focused on the economy, on other questions. Um, I've hardly met an Israeli who doesn't believe that another peace process um, leads to another round of violence. And I think this is a major obstacle that needs to be overcome. The public understanding that you can actually have security and a two-state solution at the same time, that both are not exclusive. Uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, Prime Minister Netanyahu or any other Prime Minister um, is a captive of his own coalition, of his own uh, political um, uh, narrative. Um, and unfortunately, the other process that we've seen again on both sides is that both leaderships are increasingly talking more to their own constituencies rather than to each other. And this has created um, a great divide between Israelis and Palestinians um, who have uh, uh, moved off in completely different directions um, and, and is one of the most serious obstacles that need to be overcome in order for us to, 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 to revive any semblance of a peace process. So we actually need partners for peace on all sides. So what about uh, the Palestinian leadership? There hasn't been any legislative or presidential election in Palestinian territories for more than a decade now. Everybody's saying that they are in favor of elections, but nothing is happening. Why? Can you tell us why? President Abbas made a public promise in the United Nations um, in September of this year um, that elections will take place. Um, and we have worked very hard with the Palestinian leadership, with the political parties, both in Gaza and in the West Bank, uh, to find the necessary compromises for, for such a, uh, an election to take place. 
I think that elections are, um, you know, it's, it's, it's too little to say that they're overdue. Uh, they're way overdue. It's been more than 10 years. It's actually been, I think, you know, 13 years since the last election. Um, people have the right to choose their leaders um, and that right cannot be denied to them. Um, we as the United Nations will do everything that we can to help the Palestinian people have an election. Um, however, we, just like everybody else, are, are skeptical that uh, given all the promises that have been made, um, that all the obstacles that still remain will be overcome for this election to take place. But I can assure you that over the last few weeks we have expended uh, enormous amounts of energy and time and effort to ensure that elections um, uh, take place. And I hope the Palestinian leadership will also understand that once that promise has been made to have elections, you cannot go back on that promise. And elections must happen. And they must happen in Gaza, they must happen in the West Bank, they must happen in East Jerusalem, they must uh, include the Legislative Council and they must include the Presidency. Um, this is what people expect and this is what the, it is their right to have. So we will continue to work to make this process um, uh, happen. Again, I admit that there are many obstacles that still need to be overcome. Very briefly, do you believe in it? If you had to bet, do you think there will be an election in the coming months? If I didn't have any hope, I wouldn't be in this position and I'm not really a betting person. My job is to actually work to make sure that we stand the best chance that we have to have Palestinian elections. Um, and I hope that the political parties and the leadership um, on all sides of the Palestinian equation will agree to the necessary compromises to have an election. Thank you very much, uh, Nikolai Mladino, for answering our questions. Thank you for watching this interview. And thank you to Cecilia Garcio and Matthias Somf behind the cameras. Stay tuned on France 24 for more news.